Hello, today we're briefly going to discuss moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is an object's resistance to rotation. It is the rotational analog of mass. Mass is, the, is an object's resistance to linear motion. Moment of inertia, or also known as rotational inertia, is an object's resistance to rotation. An object's moment of inertia is based on its physical properties. It's directly related to its mass, directly related to its radius or length, we measure with the variable I, and the unit is kilograms meter squared. So you notice that the meter unit is squared. So we know then that we're probably going to be squaring one of these length units as well. Okay. The generic form for an object's moment of inertia is I equals something, so some coefficient, times m r squared, or m is the object's mass and r is the object's radius or distance from the axis of rotation. We have three commonly known objects that you need to be responsible to know. Okay? The first one is a point mass. Point masses are objects that are not really rotating, they're more revolving. So when we have, let's say, some kind of axis of rotation here, and let's say we have an object that is revolving around in a circular path, so like a planet going around or like the moon going around the earth, okay? We could treat that as a point mass. Maybe it's a blob of clay on the end of a meter stick with a blob of clay on some kind of turntable. We treat those as point masses, okay? The I value for a point mass is just equal to mr squared because all of the object's mass is located a distance r from the axis of rotation. The same I value is for a hoop as well. Okay, remember, hoops and discs are different. A hoop is a hollow disc. Okay, so all of the mass of the hoop is located a distance r from the axis of rotation. So again, the I value for a hoop will also be mr squared because all of its mass is located a distance r from the axis of rotation which is the center of the hoop. So there's my axis of rotation there around the center of the hoop. The last one that you need to know is a disc. And remember, a disc is like a solid hoop, okay? So the disc is still circular, but there's mass located all the way through. The axis of rotation is again at the center, okay? And because there is mass distributed throughout, we're not gonna get into the calculus of it, But the I value for a disc is going to be lower than the I value for a hoop, and it's actually one half m r squared, where m is the total mass of the disc, and r is the radius of the disc. Okay, the one half is there because there's mass distributed throughout, and that rule will follow us all the way through. Anytime we're comparing a solid object like the disc to a hollow object like the hoop, the moment of inertia for the disc or any hollow object will always be let, I'm sorry, or any solid object, excuse me, so the I value for the disc or any other solid object will always be less than the I value for the hollow object because the mass is distributed throughout the solid object. Two other objects that we're going to be using quite often but you're not going to be responsible for is a rod about its center and a rod about its end. So let's say we have a rod. Okay, and it's being rotated about its center. So here is my axis of rotation. Okay, again, not going to get into where these values come from. It's calculus, integration, all those kind of things. About its center, the I value for a rod is 1 12th ml squared, where L is the total length of the rod. Okay, it is not half the rod, L is the whole length. Okay. And if you take the, the meter stick or something, you hold your hand and kind of shake it back and forth around the center, you'll notice it's very easy to do that. There's not much inertia there. However, if we take the same rod and rotate it about its end, and you can feel this, okay, so the axis of rotation on this end, okay, the I value for the rod about its end is one-third ml squared. So remember, one-third is greater than one-twelfth. Think about how the mass is distributed here 
for this, when it's rotated about its center compared to about its end. About the center, there's equal masses on each side. About its end, all the masses on one side. And so there will be more inertia when it's being rotated about its end. Okay, the last thing will be done here. When you have multiple objects in the system, you just add up all of their values. There is no such thing as negative rotational inertia, just like there is no negative mass. Okay, inertia is a resistance to something. You can't have negative resistance. That means that matter would cause the object to rotate faster. That doesn't happen. Okay, let's say we have a system where we had a rod let's say we have like a point mass on one end, some blob of clay, okay? And let's say the axis of rotation is here, okay? So there's our little axis of rotation. To find the rotational inertia of the system, I would add up the rotational inertia of the point mass plus the rotational inertia of the rod, okay? You treat them totally separately. You do not Try to start combining things when you're finding the I values, okay, until the very end, and then you just add them all up, okay? So in this case, this would be the M of the mass times the R of the mass, which is going to be here, okay, here's the R for the mass, squared, of course, sorry, plus, because it's rotated about its center, 1 12th the mass of the rod, just the rod, not the mass of the rod and the mass, or the point mass, just the mass of the rod times the total length of the rod squared, okay? The total length of the rod is going to be the whole length of the rod, not just part of it, but the entire thing, okay? So there's a quick intro to rotational inertia. We treat it very similar to mass. It is the rotational analog of mass. Always positive, always resist motion. Thanks!